Hi, I'm Ben. Welcome back to my channel and to what is probably my first ever proper reading vlog. And I'll be honest, I have literally no idea how to do this because I rely quite heavily normally on a script that I'd write before I start filming. Um, so I'm a bit nervous about talking off the cuff, but it will be a learning experience for all of us. Right, I was originally planning for this just to be a vlog about reading Demon Cophead because I expected it to be the only book on the Women's Prize shortlist that I hadn't read. But then along came Pod and kind of scuppered my plans. Um, Matt being the kind and generous human being that he is went out and got me a physical copy. Although to be honest, I didn't really want a copy of the book because I don't expect to love it. And I would prefer to only own in physical like books that I really like or that I think I'm gonna like. But now that I have it, I thought why not make this about both my least and most um, anticipated reads from probably the entire long list and I can share with you my thoughts as I work my way through them. I think I'm gonna start with Pod first, partly just to get it out of the way, but also because I'm really curious about what it is that's caused such a visceral reaction in people. There are people that are really disliked this book quite a lot. I've heard plenty about um, excessive violence and trauma and lots of dolphin copulation. So I'm expecting more A Little Life than A Little Mermaid. Um, and I've had a flick through and the text isn't particularly small and the chapters are quite short. So I think this will be quite a quick read. Today is a bank holiday and it's looking quite um, nice and dry and potentially sunny later on. So I think Matt and I are gonna go to the garden center, have a mooch around and then get a coffee on the way back, which will be a good opportunity to make a start with the book. So I'll take some clips while I'm out and I'll, I'll show you what we get up to. See you in a bit. So just checking in after a really lovely day, Matt and I went to the garden centre, got some plants and some flowers and we put those in our raised beds, which has really brightened the garden up and made it a lot less sad looking than it was at the start of the day. That said, I do not underestimate my ability to let those plants wither and die, as a number of houseplants would be able to attest to were they A, alive and B, able to talk. But we'll keep an eye on that and hopefully it will keep the garden looking lovely and colourful throughout the summer at least. On to my reading and I'm about 40 pages into pod now and so far it's okay. The writing is fine. I can tell what's going on. Uh, we've been introduced to all the main sort of perspectives that I assume we'll be following throughout the novel. Yeah, I don't have strong feelings either way at the moment. I'm not sure how on board with it I am. The dolphins are very humanised. They've got these really complex human-like um, societal structures. It feels actually a bit like reading a fantasy novel with like these made-up societies. I would be really interested to know how much of this is based on Laleen Paul's research into marine biology and observed behaviour in dolphins. I'm sure at least some of this is 
based on stuff that she's read and then extrapolated from to give it a bit more imagined complexity. One good thing that's come out of reading these first 40 pages is that it's actually quite an easy, quick read. So I'm a little less anxious about needing to wade through this. I thought it might be quite painful, but it's actually all right. Anyway, it's quite late now, so I am off to bed and I will check in again soon when I've made some more progress with our bottlenose friends. So I'm about halfway through pod now and to be totally honest, I am really rather sick of reading about dolphin sex and rape and sea creatures spreading their seed in the ocean. It's all a bit much. Um, I don't really have any inclination not to finish the book, though, because it's quite a quick read. And I think I will blast through the remaining half um, pretty speedily. But I'm looking forward to it being over and moving on to Demon Copperhead. Today is Friday and I'm not working Fridays at the moment. So I'm going to head into town to get some lunch. Then I might sit in a coffee shop and get through some more chapters of the Dolphin Sex book. And I might head to Waterstones because they've got some offer on at the moment where if you buy a book, you get some coronation celebration cake for free. And it looks quite nice. And I am technically on a book buying ban, but I do want to get the Benjamin Labatou, um book when we cease to understand the world. He's got a new one coming out later in the year. And... I've heard really good things about his first one. It sounds right up my street, mixing sort of science fact and fiction. So yeah, that's what I'm planning for today. I probably won't check in again now until I finish pod, at which point I might look a little bit happier. <laughs> uh, so I will see you on the other side. Hi everyone, it's now Tuesday and I'm about to film my closing thoughts on Pod and my initial thoughts on Demon Copperhead, but I thought I would first just talk to some of those clips that I've um, just put into the video. So first of all, for someone who reads a lot, I clearly cannot read my bloody emails because that Waterstones offer was not a uh, free cake with a book and it also was not applicable on a Friday, it was a Saturday to Monday offer where you get free cake with a tea or coffee. So I just went to the shop and bought a book and got nothing for free, which is disappointing, but I still feel good about uh, about a new book purchase. It was also the coronation on Saturday. And although I'm not really into the monarchy, I'm fairly ambivalent towards it all, to be honest. Um, I don't I don't think it's like the best way to determine a head of state but at the same time it feels like there are bigger fish to fry in UK society uh, but I did use it as an excuse to drink some Prosecco before 12 p.m uh, so that was fun and then Matt and I also went for a wander around the harbour side because there was a big old fire the other night um, and someone's been arrested for uh, arson so it seems like someone deliberately set one of the buildings around the harbour on fire and one of the boats that caught a light they moved it and docked it by this pub uh just across the water so that it wouldn't set all the other boats alight and yeah it was just really fascinating to go and have a look at that obviously really sad though it's um like a historic building and obviously there are people and businesses impacted so i hope that they have got good insurance and if someone did do it on purpose hopefully they uh, achieve some sort of justice because that's not that's not a good thing to do. Don't burn buildings down. That's my advice. Anyway, let's get to the books. All right, everyone. Not sure why I decided to slip into a northern accent then, but it's what it is. Um, I've now finished Pod, and let me tell you 
I have mixed feelings. But first, let me nutshell this for you because I realise not everyone will have read it and you might not know exactly what it's about. So the central story is about a dolphin called Ia and she is part of the Longi pod. These are pretty small dolphins. They're like the spinner ones that leap out of the water and spin. Um, and the Longi name comes from the Latin name for those dolphins. Um, these dolphins spin for, I guess, ritualistic reasons. And they say that it helps them uh, connect with the music of the ocean. But of course, Ia isn't like other dolphins. She doesn't really get it. She doesn't want to get involved in all of these rituals. She doesn't really get the same connection that others do from spinning. And she does not want to be involved in the festival of sex that's coming up. And that is your first warning for how sex heavy this book is. Anyway, some stuff happens that leads to Ia being cast out of her um, pod. Or I don't know if she's cast out or if she just gets lost. But anyway, she leaves her pod. She's out in the vast of the ocean and she comes across a different pod of dolphins called the Terciops, which are bigger bottleneck dolphins, again, named after the, the Latin name for that species. And they have like a more loud, aggressive culture, which is a shock to Ia and they decide Ia, you're staying with us. Um, but she just wants to escape and get back to her own pod. At the same time, there are some other storylines going on um, that we dip in and out of. And these are largely other characters that, um, through some human awfulness or another, have been left uh, on their own in the ocean. So we've got this big raw cow whale that's singing um, a really sad song about losing his pod of whales. There's this ras fish, which is this uh, big, like, luminescent fish with a big bump on his head that can change sex in certain circumstances. Um, he's quite cantankerous, a bit grumpy. Hmm, I wonder, will his heart be melted by the end of the book? And there's also a captive dolphin called Google who has been trained by the military. I'm assuming the US, although I can't remember if it's stated or not. And all of these storylines, they basically come together in one way or another by the end of the book. And unfortunately, it just didn't work for me. I speculated earlier on that Lalleen Paul might have read a bunch of marine biology and then weaved in a fictional story to bring all of the facts that she read together. And the acknowledgements basically confirm that. She like lists a bunch of sources that she's read and thanks David Attenborough, um, I'm guessing for his documentaries or she might have met him and, and had discussions with him. The thing is, this book reads very much like a, an invented fantasy novel. And there's obviously nothing wrong with fantasy. I read it myself sometimes. But you could swap out these dolphin characters for orcs and elves and dwarves uh, with a bunch of made-up culture and society. And you'd have a pretty run-of-the-mill hero's quest novel. What Paul is trying to do in this is elevate it by making it based on real stuff that goes on in the ocean and the very real consequences of human activity and general nastiness. But without knowing what's true and what's not true and what she's creatively filled in, it all feels made up. Like for me, the most powerful parts of this book are the bits where you see and experience the, the impacts of humans. And that's because you can more reliably intuit what's what's real, like what's the real thing this is based on. So the raw cow losing his pod because of some horrible human action. Um, and particularly for me, Google's storyline was, was really good. He was like trained and used by the military, sent off on some suicide mission that they didn't expect him to come back from. And I found that really interesting. I'd never known about that. And I kind of figured that that would be based on something that was true. But for the rest of the book, I couldn't really tell and I wonder if this book might have been more successful with a bit more of the research sort of brought into the foreground perhaps something like in Wandering Souls right where between chapters um, dropped in here and there she could have brought letters or news articles or snippets of research and that would have allowed me to appreciate the facts a bit more and where the storytelling was filling in the gaps and as it is I just didn't believe any of it the other problem for me was the sheer amount of sex and sexual violence. Because of the fantasy tone and because the fantasy wasn't like particularly sophisticated, sorry, sophisticated, it came across 
a bit like young adult but then muddled into that were all these really adult themes like there were multiple rapes and you should be aware that that's a thing before reading this book and it made me really struggle to figure out who this is supposed to be for like who is supposed to be interested in this honestly every few pages there is something about sex and I get that like we all know the fact that dolphins are the only other creatures than humans that have sex for fun yada 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 but it all felt so unnecessary to the point where there's like a fish getting horny for some clams and I'm thinking okay even if this is based on some observed behavior like leave that bit out we don't need to know about it. do I need to read that in a novel no I don't overall I think that there is a novel to be written on this topic and telling this story that I would have enjoyed it is sadly just not this one anyway I have moved on to Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, which just won the Pulitzer Prize. I was very excited to watch the live stream and I was shook that there were two winners, uh, both this and Trust. Um, and I was more shook that both of those were in my Pulitzer Prize predictions video. Although I can't take too much glory for that because they were both widely touted to be the front runners. Anyway, I'm 100 pages in and so far absolutely loving it. Demon is such a compelling narrator and his way of speaking is very singular. Um, in many ways, it's actually reminded me quite a lot of, uh, what's he called, Holden Caulfield from The Catcher in the Rye. Um, I really love the style of it. I love reading a character reminiscing on their life from much later on because uh, it lets you sprinkle all these tidbits in throughout the narrative and, and I guess those throwaway lines like, and we wouldn't have known it until later on that... XYZ was going to happen. That really uh, entices me to, to keep reading. And it is a long book. It's a 550 page chunkster. And unlike the marriage portrait, the font isn't a size 18. Uh, but I'm finding that it's moving along at quite a decent pace. The chapters are quite short. It's really conversational. And I want to reach for it and pick it up, which is only a good sign in a novel. Yeah, so really excited to carry on with this one and I will probably check in again uh, maybe when I'm like halfway through. So yeah, let's crack on. It's almost like a whole week later and I'm only just past halfway. Yes, I have been reading it naked. Not me naked, how dare you, the book. I've taken off the dust jacket to protect it and it's got this lovely luminous yellow underneath, although I am also then worried about getting greasy fingerprints on it. So I've been furiously washing my hands before every reading session, which maybe that's crazy. You tell me, I don't know, maybe I need help. Anyway, the slow progress is not because I've not been enjoying it or not wanting to pick it up. I definitely have, it's really good. But I've just been really busy. Um, Matt and I are going on holiday next week. And so I've been trying to get video content ready in advance so that it can be posted while I'm away and just been busy at work trying to prepare for the time off. And so I just haven't had as much time to read as I would have liked, but I am a little bit more clear from now on. So I'm hoping to rattle through the second half of this book in the next few days. So far though, I'm really, really enjoying it. The voice of demon just continues to be so compelling and entertaining and i've heard that this can be a bit of a misery fest and maybe things are going to get a lot worse but so far even through the bad stuff because demon's voice is so vivid and the way he describes people brings them to life so well i i just feel entertained so I feel sad about the situations but I don't feel depressed by any of it and I think that's really skillful for an author to be able to tell a story that is this harrowing and it not feel depressing. There has been one moment so far that has really felt like a bit of a gut punch. I just read it and felt really helpless. For those of you who have read it, it's the scene at the truck stop and I won't say any more than that. I just read it and I felt really tense and I felt really awful for Demon. But I like it when a novel makes me feel things as well. So it feels like the right balance. I'm enjoying the nods to David Copperfield so far. It's funny because I haven't read David Copperfield for about 20 years since I studied it at school. And even then, I am not convinced 
that I've read the whole thing. I am a bit more familiar with the movie adaptations. I've seen the Daniel Radcliffe one because at school they like rolled out the TV and made us watch that so that we got uh, the whole plot. And then I think we must have studied sections of the book. And then more recently, the one with Dev Patel, which was really, really good, actually. But what that has kind of given me is a big picture shape of the novel. And I don't remember it story beat for story beat. So I have a sense of what might be coming, but it still leaves a lot of room for me to be surprised. I do like the way that some of the characters have been adapted. So I was really entertained by the fact that Uriah Heep has been given the name Ryan Piles in this novel. Uh, and he's also known as U-Haul. And he's a bit of a slippery fella in this book. And I know there's a threat there because I remember that from David Copperfield. And it's like little familiarities like that that is... I think quite helpful in in the reading and I can't decide if it would be better to know more of David Copperfield or if it would really take away any uncertainty about what was going to happen in the book. But now that I think about it, m maybe that's part of the point of the novel, right? That these cycles repeat in history, these stories are told again and again and characters are fated to suffer at the mercy of some of these much bigger forces at play. But where I am right now in the book is actually a happy period. I'm bracing myself for the inevitable inciting event that's going to lead to much less happy times. So I'm kind of sad in advance for Demon, but I'm enjoying the ride while we get there. So yeah, I'm going to power on through the rest of the book and then I will share my final thoughts once I am done. I did it. I finished Demon Copperhead. Man, that is an enormous glass of wine. I had 80 pages left to read today, so I went out for a coffee or two and I finished them. No big deal, even had time for a haircut. I will let you in on two secrets. One, the second half of the book was, as expected, a lot sadder. And two, I loved it. Not the sadness, the book as a whole. But before we get into why I loved it, let's do a quick summary for anyone waking up from some year-long cryogenic sleep. This is a retelling of Charles Dickens' David Copperfield with many of the events and characters translated from 19th century Britain to 90s and noughties Appalachia, specifically focused on a place called Lee County in Virginia. The protagonist of this story is Damon Fields, better known as Demon Copperhead because he's got bright red hair. And we start from the very beginning with him getting himself born like a little blue prize fighter. And fight he has to because his life is not easy, it is marked with tragedy almost the entire way through. But it is tragedy that's dealt with very sympathetically and it never ever feels exploitative. I've mentioned this at every stage of this vlog, but I cannot overstate how engrossing the voice of Demon is in this book. Like, I want him to sit down and narrate to me my life story. If Kingsolver published Demon's interpretation of the phone book, I think I'd go out and buy it. It really is that well done. He has so many brilliant turns of phrase and paints so many vivid images with his words. Like, there's this point where he's thinking about his memories of a specific event and he's describing them as a deck of cards. And over the following pages, he uses that metaphor again and again to describe different aspects of that. So there's an embarrassing part that he is grateful that he can't remember and he describes it as being cards missing from the deck. Now look, I know that is not a mind-blowing example, but there is stuff like that on every single page of this book and it adds up to make Demon feel exceptionally real. He isn't perfect, he gets things wrong, but he's a real person with a complex interior life. And we're kind of sitting in the cockpit with him for his first 20 or so years of life. It is kind of mind boggling that this story only goes up until he's about 21 because my God, these kids grow up so fast. And by grow up, I mean do drugs. I'm sure when I was 11 years old, I was just like, 
getting to ride the bus for the first time. But the kids in this town are doing 12 hour days in summer on tobacco fields or on a garbage dump trying to find supplies for cooking meth. And they're having farm parties like P-H-A-R-M, as in pharmaceuticals, as in drugs. It's a lot. Part of me sometimes wondered if all of this really was that realistic, but I trust Barbara Kingsolver to have done her research. And research she clearly has done. Like David Copperfield, the main theme in this is institutional poverty and how it damages the lives and opportunities of many people, particularly children. But here it's updated to focus on the opioid epidemic, but in a way kind of capitalism as a whole as well. Demon has some of his own observations about this early on. He sees how being big for his age might seem like an advantage, but it's a trap because people will use him when they need an adult body that won't fight back. But particularly in the second half of the book, Demon learns about how structural the poverty he experiences is through what he learns from Mr. Armstrong, a black teacher at his school that puts up with a lot, and from June, who is a nurse and kind of a surrogate aunt to him. Having read Empire of Pain by Patrick Radenkeefe last year, I recognised a lot of the ways that opioids, in particular OxyContin, creeped into the lives of these characters. We first see it when a shady pharmaceutical rep called Kent turns up, who's June's boyfriend for a bit, and he talks about the pain scale and the movement that his company is trying to spearhead to fight the war against pain. And that all really happened. Purdue Pharma invented that to try and sell their pills. I thought it was really interesting that Purdue Pharma is actually name checked multiple times in this book and rightly so. Their products laid absolute waste to entire communities and created this dangerous, corrosive, toxic dependence on their products. I thought it was all very well done though and it was never jarring. Like we never seemed to mode switch into now you are learning a lesson about American society. It all weaved into the plot exceptionally well. She was never trying to shoehorn in her research. And the writing in general was just exceptionally good. Loved the nods to that Holden guy and Demon having read Dickens and appreciating how Dickens understood kids and orphans being screwed over but no one really caring. If there's one criticism I would lay at the book it is that the character of Dory becomes quite central and quite important to Demon. He becomes very much in love with her and intoxicated by her and takes certain actions because of her. But I didn't get the fuss. Like, I don't think she was a particularly appealing person. And I understand how a lot of it is driven by addiction and how addiction can be unreasonable. But I just thought she was a bit annoying. If you've read it, maybe you think differently. But to me, I didn't get it. I really love this book. And it gave me the same feels as books like The Secret History and A Little Life, where I felt so incredibly immersed and didn't want to leave the world of these characters. This book feels destined to become as beloved as those two. But that did get me thinking, what these books have got in common is that they are male protagonists written by women writers. And I have no goddamn idea why I find that so compelling. Is it because I'm a man? that I feel like I can relate to these characters. And it's got me wondering, where are all the engrossing female protagonists in my life? Maybe that's a reading mission for another time. This book is an absolute marvel, and I think it is destined to become an Oscar bait movie at some point. I just hope it doesn't go the way of Hillbilly Elegy because hmm. that is one thing I'll say for Pod though. It really is a story that could only be told in the medium of a novel because it is an utterly unfilmable story. And I take that as a win for books. So we get to end on a positive note for Pod. That concludes this reading vlog. If you are still here, thank you very much. I owe you one. And if you want to hit the like button, I owe you two. If you have read Demon Copperhead, I would love to hear what you thought of it in the comments. But until next time, toodles. <laughs>